there is a setup section in the notes. So take a look at that and get yourself set up in class slash 11 and pull down the uh, org mode file. It runs off the right here. But if you copy this link, it will give you the whole link to the org file. <coughs> We're going to be using the terminal a lot today. The way you've been working with the split Emacs on one side and uh, the terminal is actually a good idea. Yeah, we're going to be doing terminal and Emacs together. And so I would, for this one, I recommend using a regular terminal as opposed to the terminal inside of Emacs. But if you wanted to use either, it's fine. So yeah, let's go ahead and run putty. That is a little weird. You can always just reinstall the tool. It might also be disabled. Let me take a quick. Um, you can turn on and off things. So go if tools, click on add-ons, and there should be one of those icons is like a. Yes, yeah, so I have to re-install. Uh, so extensions, I think. Plugins. Plugins. Yeah, it looks like it's disappeared. Yeah. It's possible that Firefox updated itself and. For this. Make directory. Should we be signed in? Like, should I be mluke at research tools or? No, no. So on the virtual machine, you are the user of research tools. Always. That's if you were logged oh. into the research tools server, okay. then you would want to see an mluke in there. Okay. Well, we are a full room today. Yeah, Keep the. So, so make sure you get the uh, org file down. All right. So don't forget to log into the IRC today for class, and I'll try and do a better job of answering questions inside the IRC. I'm going to try and keep it open inside of Emacs here with the uh, ERC client, which is a chat client for Emacs. I am not very familiar with it. And today, last time we showed you the very beginnings of looking at IPython and maybe doing some plots. Today, we're going to start building up our knowledge base with Python in terms of simple data types that we can use without having to, to know too much. It's got all kinds of nice functionality for us that will really help out and make it easy to write programs. I'm hoping that unlike Bash, which was kind of quirky in every single way that we ran into, Python is designed to be very uniform and similar so that hopefully it looks the same as you go through it. A couple announcements. Remember that Homework 3 is due today. I'll show you a little hint on homework three for those of you who are having trouble for today. There's a playlist on YouTube for the videos. And I've created, I think we're up to seven videos now that run in the range of 15 minutes to almost a half an hour. Video seven covers a lot of the material in class today, but not all of it. If you're having trouble with the bash cell, parts one and two go over the basics and a little bit different way than I do in, in here. So hopefully the slight variations will help you figure out parts if there's any trouble. If you're having trouble understanding the section in the homework for homework three, where you create the file name, this research tools video six, bash part two variables will help you understand variables. And so I expect that you guys are watching those and keeping up with them. There is a, they're fairly long, but hopefully we'll give you a good way to follow along. We won't go over things like MATLAB and Mathematica too much, if at all, in this class. But they're useful to know about and very powerful. So next uh, Monday on the 10th at 2 PM over in Kingsbury, there will be a presentation going over some of the, the stuff in Mathematica that's pretty cool. Mathematica has a heavy focus on repeatable research. So you're basically building up a document that is your work and your description and your plots. And so some of the, the stuff in repeatable research in that sort of area of interest been developed in Mathematica and people are copying some of the functionality of Mathematica and vice versa. I also want to mention that UNH has an IT newsletter called Signals that has important announcements for the UNH community in terms of computers. There's an article by our chief information officer or CIO in the most recent one I have some notes in here about how I disagree with what she said. I think her uh, emphasis on changing passwords is a little bit over-exaggerated, and I want to remind you guys to focus on having a different password for each account, and think about KeyPassX to help you there. I'll let you guys read that on your own. 
And let's talk quickly about your homework. Some of you are having trouble coming up with the file name, and I gave you something that looks like this in the homework as to where to submit your homework. So if I do copy and paste that into here, what I gave you was actually a shell script command that will actually generate the name of your file. So I wasn't expecting you to type in the year, month, day. I was really asking you to use a command in the shell that generates the year, month, day of right now. If you typed in 2011 10 04, I knew if you did that before today that you were submitting something that you wrote out by hand. That's okay, but the idea was that you could actually do this by hand or you can do it with a shell script. So if you see here, if I create a file name and I use echo to test it out, in this account, this section in here with the dollar sign and left parenthesis, right parenthesis, runs off and runs the date command. So if we just grab that section and paste it, echo date, it's the equivalent of just running date by itself. And it has the syntax where you can specify which part of the date you'd like to see. So as you're building up scripts in the future, think about automating your, your processes. So if you do something every day and you're generating a report for the day when you're on the ship, why don't you have the code actually write out the file name with that date in it so you don't have to remember what's the date because you might be at sea going across the date line. It can get really confusing. So you can actually create a date command that knows about time zones or you can ask for UTC. You can ask for the UTC date or a specific time zone and so that way, when you generate log files, they're always tagged the same way, and you haven't typoed. It's very easy. Say if I was typing in the date myself, I might say 2011, 10, 04, and happily go on. And if you noticed here, my year is actually quite a bit far in the future, if you add an extra zero in there. So every time you type stuff, you have potential for making a mistake. So use the computer to do things for you so that you have more time to focus on your science and spend less time thinking about what day of the week is it. So hopefully if you haven't done the homework yet and this gave you some trouble, this might give you a better explanation of what's going on. And you can see I tried it on my laptop, which is a Mac, and it has a different looking path than you'll see over on the research tools one, which over here was that. So it, it knows how to deal with each machine and I don't have to worry about the changes between computers. Okay, here's a link to that today's class video to go with it. And before we dig into Python, I'm going to point you at some resources, but you need to remember that there are two major groups of Python right now. There's the Python in the wild. No, sorry. No. There's Python 3, which is the new fancy version of Python that's got some slightly different features and syntax than the Python we're using. We're using Python 2. So if you start seeing documentation for Python 3 and you use it, it's close to what you want, but there's a few little things that are going to trip you up. Try to stick with Python 2 documentation while doing stuff with this class. In fact, some of the, the material I'm going to point you to, the default is actually the Python 3 documentation, and you need to be looking at the Python 2.7. That's going to change in the next couple of years, but we're not really sure when. And I've got in here for you some links to the quick references. So there's a link for our IPython quick reference. I've also linked to some books. The book that I think is probably the best for beginning if you want a totally different way of thinking about beginning Python is Dive into Python by Mark Pilgrim. It's both free and for sale. So if you want to support an author, you can buy the book, but you don't have to. And there's a wiki book where you can actually change the book if you don't like what's in there. Think Python is the computer science way to think about Python. And that's not what I'm going to be trying to do in this class. So Think Python is what a computer scientist would think about and try to approach Python. We're going to avoid that. Byte of Python is one where actually the link is straight at Python 3, so you got to watch out for that. And data structures and algorithms is another one that's very computer science-y. And if that's helpful to you, feel free to go for those. Now the last one is a weird one. It's the programming historian. So these are two professors who do history research. And so their point of view is from a historian and not a computer scientist, it's very much like this course in that they're focused on computing for history. And I have no idea what that's really like. But they use things like Zotero for bibliographic references. So you'll find a, another completely different view of Python 
that might be helpful if you're not understanding what's going on in this class. I meant to give you some links to books in Safari, and I haven't done that, so there's a little fix in there. In here for afterwards, there's some really fancy stuff you can do when you're inside of IPython, where you can ask it to edit files for you, and it will then pop open Emacs. I'm going to leave that for you guys to work on, and we'll get, we'll get back into that, and we'll definitely use it on Thursday. But I'm putting it in here just so that it's up front and you guys can see it. It's very, very handy to be able to be in IPython and just ask your editor to please open and edit this file. And then you can tell from Emacs back to IPython that you're done editing. So that's really nice. The one thing you have to watch out for is the default mode drops you into a program called VI. And if you ever see VI, which is, uh, you're going to see a bunch of funny percents, there's one VI command to know. That's a colon, a Q, and an exclamation point. Does everyone know what that does, right? You all got it? Wonderful. No. This is the command to quit out of VI without saving whatever file you're editing. That, that is the command that I remember from VI. I know a couple others because I have to, but that's the one that I want everybody to know because if you get stuck in VI, it's really hard to quit out of it. It doesn't like control C or control Z, all the usuals. Colon Q bang. That gets out of VI. So some of you may hit that today by accident and not realize it, and so I'll point you at that part of the whiteboard. So make sure you're running Emacs. We're already doing that. Let's get to the fun part with Python. Open up a terminal and start IPython in that directory. I've run IPython. Now normally I would have said make sure you add the dash dash pylab. We're not going to do any plotting today, so I can leave that out. And make sure if you do a print working directory, pwd, that you're in class 11. If you're not there, you can cd to class 11 if you're in your home directory. So everybody get into IPython and do a PWD and make sure that you're sitting in class 11. Yep. Why don't you open up your IPython terminal? Control U to clear the line. LS. Okay. You saved it in the wrong place. So you need to cd into class. So cd to CLASS. Press enter. Now do an LS. Now you can do an mkdir for make directory, space 11, press enter, cd into there, space 11. Now you can do a mv, we'll see if this works, mv space, and then tilde slash, tilde slash, and then 11, press tab, space, and then period. Now I'll move it to your current directory, press enter. Now do an ls. And there you go. Great. So if you have saved your org mode files to the home directory, you could do a mv tilde slash 11 dash, and then I would press the tab key to complete this out. I don't have it there, but it would be ipython.org, and put a period for the current working directory, and that would move it into your current directory. I'm not going to run that because I saved the file into my current directory. So if I do an ls-l, you'll see that I have 11-ipython.org. So if you run this wget command, and in ipython, if you're in ipython, you can do an exclamation point. So this is kind of a fancy feature of ipython, is you can run any bash shell line that you want in here. So if I paste that wget command right there and press enter, it's going to go off and get that file and with wget, if you keep doing it multiple times, you'll end up with a dot one, two, ten, twenty. So you didn't put a period after your move to move to the destination. So hit the up arrow, the space key, and then period, full stop, press enter. Let us know when you get the aha moment. <laughs> okay. Oh, put an exclamation point before the wget. If you start in IPython, if you put an exclamation point, and then a command. In here, you'll be running bash. So you can put any bash command you want after that that's available from the regular shell. You can get to it by just putting an exclamation point in the front. There's a couple ways in IPython to get help. The first one is you can go to the web. And if I click on that docs link, you can go to the Python documentation and you can read all about it. That, there's a lot there. It's great to get lost. 
inside of IPython, we can get help on anything that we run into. So let's try help open. So again, that's help and then open. Now, IPython's kind of nice for you. It lets you be lazy. So you'll see me be lazy here. And I left out the parentheses on open. And it rewrote my command with parentheses for me and said, I'm going to go run this instead. So you'll see me do that a lot in class. But we can also say open and a question mark and say, huh, I don't know what this is. Press Enter. And you get a lot smaller help. I think two question marks. We'll try to give you more help, but it looks the same. Now, this is kind of tough. You'll see a lot of stuff in here that you don't necessarily understand. By the end of the semester, hopefully that stuff becomes familiar. And we can use the question mark and help to get help on various things as we go. And we can also say, there was a question last time about exit versus capital exit. So if we do, and you can put the question on either side, we can say exit. And so this one exits out of Python. It tries to do it in a safe manner where it asks you yes or no. If we ask about capital exit, exit without confirmation. So that means if you type exit, two parentheses, it says, I don't know what that is. There we go, exit, yeah. You are in VI mode. Oh, sorry. So you get to do Q. <laughs> Q did it. Okay. So you were in a, if you get an extra bang, you're in like a less mode that's a, related to VI. So if everything stops working. Q, yeah, there you go. I Python. OK. Exit, exits quickly with a capital E. Exit with lowercase, keeps you there. If you do help and open, you're in this mode. It's very similar, and Q also works without the uh, colon, so you can just do Q. Yep. It's whichever side you, you're feeling like, so either side. You know what we'll do? I'm going to do Shift and Tab, and I'm going to collapse everything so I can get myself sorted out. Press Tab in here. We just did Getting Help. In here, when you see some of these examples, you guys have been very enthusiastic about the Control C, Control Cs which I think is great. You've been doing them even when I didn't expect you to. If you do hit this, control C, control C, evaluate on this section. I type yes. And when I say print one, and if we did a print one over here, it prints one, it looks great. We're going to have a little bit of trouble doing that. So don't expect this to work. When you do print one, it returns none, which is not really what you wanted. The equivalent way of doing this inside of here is return one. You're going to get results you didn't expect, and you'll get more comfortable with this as we write functions and understand what it's trying to do for us. So basically, if you do a control C, control C today when I didn't ask you to, <laughs> don't expect to see any results that, that actually mean anything. There might be a whole lot of code that looks like it should be doing stuff, and it's just going to ignore you. So we started IPython, collapse this section. So let's go ahead and start playing with Python inside of our IPython shell before we do anything fancy. Let's just start off by creating a string. This is a string. Now Python has three ways to do strings, so you'll see them all. You can do a single quote, my string. You can do a double quote and some text. And then you can do three single quotes. So those are three different things in there and three single quotes and some text. If you see those in any of the notes, we're just going to use the top one, this guy right here, so that single quote around our strings. Unfortunately, this is one of those places where it can, you can do it lots of ways, and it will just confuse you for starters. So we're just going to do single quotes for strings. So if you press Enter, you get this is a string. We can do things with strings. We can say this is a string dot capitalize. We can ask it to capitalize a string. We could ask it to uppercase that string, so it's really ugly, it's shouting at us. And we could do a lower if we wanted. We can also ask it to make it like a title, where it capitalizes the beginning of each word in there. So there's lots of functionality with each of these objects. We can even add strings together. Now, it might sound a little weird to be adding strings. They're not really numbers. And so in Python, sometimes things like the plus Try to give you a meaning that makes more sense for that object. So we can say, this is, we'll put a plus in between each one, a string. What it does is it glues them all together, except for 
it doesn't have the concept of a space between those. You actually have to add any spaces that you want to have if you want it to actually be legible. So you can start building up things. If you're building up like a sentence in something or you're building a report, you could put in the number in between it that you want it to have, and it would then start building your report. Now, Python has a nice feature that you can ask it what the type of something is. This is a string. And it returns back that it's an str, which is short for string in Python. We could also ask type the number 1. That is not an L. We'll pick a different number. How about 33? And it's going to say that's an int or integer. So let's take a look at the data types in Python. This is what we're going to build the class out of, are these little components. As you go along, you're going to be using these to keep your data around in various forms and work with as you are building your programs. So let me just walk through these and give you a sense of them up on the whiteboard so we've got something to hang on to. We've got strings, and that's referred to by str. We've got numbers. And if you're a scientist, this is where life gets exciting, right? You can actually have numbers of things and compute stuff. We have a couple different types. We have integers, and that's like the number 1 or 2 or negative 5, etc. We have floats. Those are your real numbers, so 1.2345 minus 6.1, 0, period. If you want 0 to be a floating point number, you have to have a period in there. Or you could say, how about 1.2e21. So that's something to the power of 21. So that's a pretty big number. Hopefully it should take it. Let's try it real quick. So 1.2e21. That's a pretty big number. We also have what are called bools or boolean. And that might be a little surprising. You don't maybe use that word in your vocabulary. But once you see what booleans are in terms of the possible values, you'll probably get it pretty quick. That's one possible is true. And the other one is false. This is the yes, no, true, false world. We refer to that as Boolean, or in Python, it's bool, written like that. So you'll see that a lot. And if you're doing like an if test, then it tests whether the Boolean, or the true value, is true or false. We also have lists or sequences. And these are just a series of stuff. Some of them are ordered, some of them are not. The most common one we're going to use is a list. And this is written with square brackets. And inside can be any number of things. We could have like minus 2, 1.9, and the word high. So you can put anything in there. They don't have to be the same type. You can just start gluing things together. We have something called tuples. Tuples are basically lists that are less powerful, so or I'm not going to talk too much about those, so you'll see sometimes parentheses. Sets. Sets are fun. As you go through data, say you're reading a list of ship names and there's lots of duplicates. If you go into a set and you keep adding ship names, you add the same name like 10 different times, it's only going to keep one of, of that. So it's a set contains only up to one. So here in a list, we could have the number 1 followed by the number 1, followed by 3, followed by 1. That's OK. In a set, if we said set of 1, 1, 3, 1, we're going to get back just 1 and 3. So if you're trying to find the unique set of things, that's a nice way to do it. So if you're reading through data, that's often, if you're reading a set of NEMA strings, these uh, codes that we saw from our GPS upstairs, you could pull those out of each sentence, throw them into a set, and after you read through all the data, you could see which, which NEMA sentences did I have. One that's actually really handy that you'll probably end up using a lot is called a dictionary. And what this has is it's going to be a set where you have a key and a value. And if you have a key, you can ask the dictionary, do you know about that? So our key could be geology. And then to go with it could be any value, say 10. And basically that gives you a lookup table where if you want to store values for something, you can have this be, the key can be a name, a number, any number of different things, and then you have a value to go with it. So it's a matching, a pairing of things. And we'll go through examples of each of these and see them. 
There's also two other ones that are pretty important. Um, the other one is file. So we can have files that we can open. We'll be able to, and the, the key thing there is we will use the word open. And there's a special one called none. And we'll see that a few times. None represents nothing. It's the, I didn't have anything to give you, so I'm going to give you none. Or I don't have a value for you. So none is kind of a special case that we'll keep running into, and hopefully you'll get a feel for it down the road. So those are the basic types of things we're going to use to build up programs. And later on, we'll add some control logic for it. So let's do a little bit of IPython before we dig into these data types, because it's going to help us figure things out. There's two commands I want you guys to know, who and whose. So if we type who, there's nothing in our space. This is uh, a command that people often use in MATLAB, very similar to this, that tells you all the variables that are in your working space. If you do whose, you get the same thing. There's nothing. So let's just say ship name equals RV Cochico. Some of you might know that ship. And now if we type who, it tells us there's a ship name, if I can spell ship right, ship name, who. Now there's two of them. I can do a delete of a variable, my misspelled ship name. And if we type who again, you can see that it's gone. If we type whose, you can actually see the values that go with a particular variable. So if you're working with a test data set in IPython and you're trying to figure out how to do something, this is a great way to look into your workspace and see what variables are loaded. If you're doing a pretty big problem over a few hours, you might forget what variables you have loaded up into the system. Who and whose are great tools to go look at what's in there. Can you change the type of a variable? Yep, and we'll talk about that. Some variables can be changed into other types of variables, and we'll show some examples of that. Especially with numbers, we'll see how to convert numbers to and from strings. There's also a command that you may want to have, and it's called log start. So if I do an ls-l first, there's nothing up my sleeve. And we say log start. And what this does is it's going to record your session to a file. So if you want to go in later on and find that, you could type history and copy paste that into Emacs and deal with it that way. But with log start, you're now writing a file. And there's now this file called IPython log pi. And you can actually tell it to pick a different name. But this way, you're recording your session. And so if you're really working through a problem, you don't want to worry about maybe taking notes for a while. You really need to think about it. A log is a great way to see what's going on and then come back and pick out the pieces that you really wanted. And then you can say log stop, and it's done. Notice there's these special magic commands you'll sometimes see with a percent. You can leave those off, and it will guess those. Don't worry too much about these funny magic commands, but if you see the percent, that's a special IPython only tool. So now you've got a log file if you want it. And I will say log dart myself. Make sure it's got a file in there. And notice that it's actually going to keep other stuff around. Do some backups. It's kind of nice. And let's try out some data types. So I think it's best to just see these things in action and get a feel for what they can do. So let's open up the strings one. And just go ahead and type ship name equals coastal surveyor. And let's see what we can do with this ship name variable. We can ask the length of it. Remember, you can always press tab if you get part way through. So ship and then tab. So we have 16 characters. We can ask for a particular character. The square brackets after a variable is sort of a lookup into this list of things. So 0 will be our first. In Python, we're going to think like computer scientists, and we're going to start counting from 0. So if you ask for 1, it's not the first letter. It's the second letter. We can ask for a range of things. So let's get the fifth through the eighth characters in there. And it's going to give you what's at position 5, 6, and 7. We can find a letter. So let's go back here. And if you have a variable name and you put a dot, and then something after it, that's something that comes with that object. So it's got a bunch of things that it knows how to do. So if we type find, 
and then we'll pick the letter S. Hopefully this will find the letter S somewhere in there. And the letter S is at position 8. Now what we can also do is now if you know where it is, you can say give me thing, everything from position 8 on. By leaving out this part, you get a, by leaving a blank in there, it'll go to the end. If we just want the second word, we know it started with an S, you can get surveyor. We can also count from the back. So minus one is the last character. So that's the R. Or if we do minus four, that's the E. And again, you could do a colon and go to the end. So you can slice apart the string, get different bits of it. If we uh, keep going here, looks like that's the same text repeated. That's not very exciting. And let's go down and try some numbers. We can do the number one. And that's a number. So we can say type 1, that's an integer. We can do 1.1, and get back 1.1. And we can say type of that. And that's a floating point number. So that would be, again, this range of things in there. If you've done MATLAB before, you should be bored by now. But we can say 3.1415. This is how to change a string into a number. And so that converted it to a number. So we can then say, what is the type of what we got back? And it actually converted that string in single quotes into a number. Now, what if we did something kind of crazy here? Hi, mom. You think that's going to work? Probably not. I don't know what the number would be for that. And it's going to tell you there's a value error, could not convert string to float. So you're going to start seeing some of these error messages. We'll start small, and you'll eventually get comfortable with them. They can be a little overwhelming sometimes in big programs. You'll get what's called a traceback, and it might tell you a lot, a lot more than you're ready for. <laughs> but uh, hopefully this will get you a, a slow start at that. Let's do something kind of funny. We'll, we're going to do something called import math. Import goes off and brings in some extra functionality that we might want. So import math, and we can say math.py. Suddenly, we don't have to remember the number for pi. It's given to us. We can do math.sign math.pi divided by 2. And we'll get back, and it's doing radians here for us. We've got all sorts of math functions in there. We can do things like convert from radians, degrees to radians, and radians to degrees. So here's math.radians 180. So if I remember right, that should be pi. So get back pi. And if we did times 2, the radians, that's 2 pi. We can also do math.degrees, 2 times math.pi. Guessing that's all the way around the circle. So if I remember right, this should be 360. So there's degrees. We don't really know what's in there. If we've got this module, and we haven't looked inside. So we can type math period and tab, and it will list off all the things that are inside of there that we can use. And for now, if you see underscores, please don't worry about them. Just ignore them. Pretend they don't exist. Anything with an underscore in it will be something fancier that we might look at later on. But for now, just look at things like math.py. This is power. And so we can say math.power question mark, and we could go ask it, what does power do? And here it returns x to the power of y. Now, if you start doing things like acoustics, you might need a different kind of math. You might need complex numbers. We've got those for j. There's a complex number. But you didn't have to put math in front of it? Complex, so it doesn't actually come as a part of the math tools. So complex is built right into to Python itself. The math module is kind of like pattern established by C in the 70s, where math is like the function sine function trigs and whatnot are not a part of the normal system. We can also do complex math, so 4j plus or times. Take your favorite operator, 2 plus 9j. And we get back that some complex number. And if you do complex math, you'll get very familiar with this, and you can use it in all sorts of stuff. So those are your basic numbers and strings. Let's go look at one of those containers that we had here, these sequence items. List and dictionary are the two that you'll use all the time. So we'll start off with list. 
And maybe we want to create a list. Uh, it's a sequence of numbers. And I know it was definitely asked in one of the classes for the hour part, how do we make a range of numbers? Because it really sucked to type hour 0 through 23. And I forgot 0 in class. There's a command called range. And if you type that, this is where it's very clear that Python is counting from 0. It's going to give us five numbers, but it's going to start from 0. So we'll see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, but not 5. You can also tell it where to start. So we can start from 2. And so it's going to give us 2, 3, 4, but not 5. With range, we can also say how often to jump or how much to jump. So let's do range 3, comma, 28, 5. It's going to jump by 5s going up until but not including the highest number of 28. So it's going to start at 3, jump by 5s, up till 27, including 27, but not including 28. We can make our own list, which is probably more interesting most of the time. So let's say, I'm going to pick a much simpler example than I did before. We have a tug, we have a rowboat, and we have an RV for a research vessel. Except for I used the wrong brackets. Use the square brackets, not the round ones. And if we say type ship, we get a list. So go ahead and create a list. We can also append to ship. If, if you had used parentheses, it would have given you an error because you can't make that a tuple. We can certainly make a, so I'll do this temp. It's happy to do it. And we can say type temp for temporary, and it's a tuple. It's just we can't now change that. Once a tuple is fixed into memory, you can overwrite a totally new tuple, but you can't change it. So it's not very fun to work with. Tuples, you'll see them, and people often start learning tuples, but they're really boring. Like, you can't add onto a tuple. You can make a new tuple, but you can't change it. And I think it's really nice to just mentally be able to change what you're working with. They exist for speed. It's a great question. So if you have a tuple, it uses much less memory. It's a much more fast object to walk across in terms of the system. So if you have a lot of these, and say you have like a million uh, lists of things, if you make them all lists, it's going to use more memory, and it's going to take longer to walk across them. So really, if you've got a couple, you've got to copy it into a list? You can always say, so list temp, and it will return back a list. We can also say tuple and ship and get back a tuple from a list. It's easy to switch back and forth, and it doesn't matter too much until you get to really big data sets that you really want to be using tuples. So for beginning, just think about lists. And when someone says tuple, say, I think you mean list, and I'm going to go on. That's definitely some advanced stuff. So let's go back to our ship list. And in here, we can ask the length of that. So length of ship. We've got three of them. But what if we forgot one? Ship.append will say passenger. And now if we look at ship, it's got one more on the end. So we can then add to this, which is kind of nice. We can sort this list. Now this is one that trips people up, including myself pretty often. Sort doesn't return anything. It sorts the list in that actual list. So you can't then sort something and assign it to another variable. You have to sort it and then later on assign it if you want to have a sorted list that's separate. If I press Enter, it looks like nothing happened. So sort's kind of weird like that. If we type ship again, though, notice that here's the before. So it started off with tug. And here's the after, where it starts off with passenger, and tug is now at the end. So it sorted them alphabetically. Can you sort things in various ways? Probably? We can say ship.sort, and we can ask it. Okay. You can. This part right here, which you're probably not comfortable with yet, the CMP, is you can pass it some function that does the comparison any way that you want. And that's a little more advanced to do things like that. But you can create a function that sorts it, and you can define however it is that you want it sorted. And maybe I'll get up to you as homework just for fun. No. no, I won't do that for a while. This is where it takes a little while to get used to reading the documentation. But their compare right now is a simple one that's just alphabetical. And you have to write some function that returns negative 1, 0, or 1, whether or not an object is less than, equal to, or greater than. 
So it's really powerful, but it's going to get confusing pretty quick when you're beginning. So we're not going to worry too much about it, but sort can definitely do that. We can, just like the string, we can say ships zero and get our first ship. We can get the last ship with a minus one. And we can also ask it, what does ships know how to do to themselves? Other than sink or run aground or... So in here, we have all these underscore methods that you're going to totally ignore. And you're going to look just over here at the append, count, index, insert, pop, remove. So they've got some things they can do. and We can try some of those. And we can also try remove. So ship.remove. And we're going to say tug. And now if we take a look at our ship, we no longer have that tug on there. We can also say there's one called pop, which just takes one off the end. Wave your hands around, or I'm not going to have any idea that you're having troubles. <laughs> so you hit sh uh, ship period and pressed enter. That's going to give you an error because you haven't told it what to do. So you can do ship period, press tab. And now you're getting a list of functions. And then you, it's up to you to type more stuff after that. So that's a good one. If you guys don't wave your hands, you're going to be missing out on stuff that I assume is obvious and is not. So if you have a set of things, you can pop one off the top and throw it out. It's uh, off the end, off the, the right-hand side. Why don't you type ship.pop and question mark and press enter and see if it tells you. So hopefully it will tell us. So the default is last. Yes? So ship period and now the full stop, period, now tab, and now you get a list. In the notes I called it ships with an S and in class I just did ship without an S. There's a little bit of confusion there. That's a good one I just heard. So ship question mark. That tells you it's a list. If you say ships question mark, object not found. I don't have a ships. And remember the who? There are my variables or whose. We'll show you the different variables you've got and what's in them. Now, like for example, if you look at this math one, don't worry about that too much. You'll start to understand that down the road, that it's a, what a module is. For now, we'll just use them without worrying too much. So let's try some fancier stuff with strings. Maybe we want to turn a string into a list and break it into pieces. We'll do numbers, plural. 1, 2, 3, 4, 99. So let's go ahead and create that numbers variable. And what if we want to list with each of those in a separate, actually, let's make it more interesting. We'll do 10. There's with strings. So we can say type numbers. So remember that numbers is not an actual number. We can take our numbers. If we hit tab, there's lots of different functions. But one of them is right here is split. And we can ask split, what does it do? And what it does is it will break this into various chunks on some sort of separator that we want to ask it. So we can say numbers split. The default is a space or white space. And so now we have our numbers broken up into a list where it used, if we just type numbers to re-see our variable, it's going to break it up on white space. So that's nice to be able to break things apart. If we have, for example, if we go ship name equals Gulf Challenger comma RV. Maybe somebody likes to write the type of the ship afterwards with a comma. So if we save that variable and we say ship name dot split, it's not going to give us what we want. It's going to break it into Gulf Challenger. And then the comma will be inside of here. This is hard to read. And then RV on the right. We want to split on that comma. So say uh, if you're dealing with comma separated value data, you can split on anything you want in here. You can press return. And it's going to split it on that comma character and give us Gulf Challenger as the first thing and RV as the second. So now we can say, give us the first one, and we just get Gulf Challenger. So let's do that a little bit more clearly. We'll say fields equals ship name dot split. And we'll split on the comma. So now we have this variable called fields, which is type, should be a list, is a list. We can say name equals fields sub zero. What do you think is going to be a name? 
Anyone want to give a guess? Golf Challenger, excellent, yes. So if we type name like that, we get back Golf Challenger. Now we can also do some funny things. We can say name times four. What do you guys think multiplication with a string is going to be? Yep, question? You typed S-P-L-I without the T. So it's split, and then you have to put parentheses, right parentheses. Now type fields and press enter. Type who? So you have ships plural. So you can do a sh But we're using ship name. So type fields equals ship name. And then do the split. So ship name dot split. So if you see on number 93 up there, you see me partially going through things. So every time I press tab, so I type ship, I press tab right here. It said your options are ship and ship name. So we're still at 93. I haven't pressed enter yet. Field equals ship name. So I completed out to there. Pressed the period or full stop. Typed SPLI and I asked it to finish for me. So I pressed tab and it said I give you split or split lines, which we don't know about. And so here I've said I just want split, finish it, and only here did I press enter. So I never pressed enter up here for either of those commands. It was only once I had the full command written and I pressed enter that I then, if you see here, this is the command number where I ran it. These are, this is a great question. And so when you see it jump from 93 to 94, I actually pressed enter and ran the command. So does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what names times four will do? It's kind of a strange thing, multiplication. What is it going to do? You're going to get four of them together, correct. And what just happened here? <laughs> that was lovely. So that was the secret answer you couldn't see. <laughs> there it is. Looks like uh, the enter key got stuck. So yes, you can do some weird functions like that. It might not matter much for you right now, but say you want to do something like a big dash line in your output, and you want 80 characters of dashes across the screen. There you go. It's helpful, it's just not always obvious why you might want to learn about these things until you run into a case where you're like, oh wait, I can multiply that string times 80 and I've got a big long line. Type who, and I'm gonna go ahead and show what I've done here. So hopefully that history won't look too terrible with the uh, million blank lines. So history, oh yuck. <laughs> Real data has real problems, right? Uh, we'll just scroll all the way back here. So in here, command 96 is where I made the name. So I grabbed the first one of the entries in the fields and stored that in the variable name. And then in 97, I was just printing it out by typing name and hit enter. And then I multiplied it by four. And now I get... What it does is it takes the string, it takes four of them and glues them together. But what if I want to glue them together in a special way, like commas or words? Thank you, I missed a line there. So if you want to join things together with a particular character, oh, okay. and it's sorry, it's a hard to read color in the output, I need to get smarter at my cascading style sheets, which I don't really know. Let's say who, whose, and see what I've got here for variables. Let's take our temp TMP variable. And I want to join it with the uh, space, two dashes and a space. This actually has something called join. It doesn't always know how to get you help, unfortunately, but join and TMP. And what this does is if you have a string and you want to use it to join things together, you call join and pass it a list of items, and it's going to put this string in between each of those items. So if I wanted to make a CSV out of this, I could replace this with a comma, take all your fields, join them with a comma, and you now have a, a CSV. So if you're trying to write yourself a CSV file to go load into something like Excel or Numbers or OpenOffice or LibreOffice, this is how you might do it. But is the original, did it, does that change it at all? So this is just outputting it. So okay. if you see the out here, it's just writing it nowhere. So if you want to save it, so if you want to say my... Yeah. Okay. CSV, now you have. I'm still getting to know some corners of IPython, and I'm trying to teach you stuff often that I've only just figured out because I'm 
I've, I've done it like a crusty bad way that I didn't like. And so when I try and show you guys, I try to remove all of the stuff that I learned that was bad and remove my bad habits and only teach you the good habits. <laughs> I don't always succeed, but I try. Let's go ahead and create a file. So we're going to learn how to write a file, and then we're going to use it to read back in. You can just do a control C, control C inside of this block, but I recommend skipping that because it's not as much fun, depending on how you define fun. And we're going to go ahead and copy this, which is also meta W. And we're going to paste that in. And what this is doing, the open command opens a file. So let's walk through here. Open will open a file. You're going to give it a file name. So data.csv, comma, and then this part here, the in quotes w, says we want to open it for writing. We want to be able to put data into that file. It's important to know that if you had some very important data in that file, the minute we run this command, you can wave goodbye to your nice data as it disappears. The w will step on or kill anything that's there with that name. Press enter, and you now have this new variable called file, and we'll say type called out, which is of type file. And we can now say out.write. So now we can write our data. One comma two. Slash n is a strange string thing. If you use the, the slash that leans to the left, which is the one that's above your return key, and then a character, those have special meaning. And if we'd wanted to put a slash in there, an actual slash character, we'd have to do two slashes, and that would turn into a slash in the output. But slash n is a new line. If we didn't do this, you would have all of your numbers on the same line, and it would turn into a big mess. So slash n puts a new line into the string, which then goes out to the file with write. So we'll go ahead, press Enter. And let's do this two more times with different data, 4 comma 5 and 9 comma minus 1. That was me. The pound is a comment. And then I was sort of showing you that two slashes turn into a slash. I'm learning better to put a pound in there to make sure that when people don't just hit enter without realizing it, that they haven't done something completely crazy. Because it's not always obvious what if I'm trying to write a note, just like, hey, look what I'm doing, it gets confusing. Right. Close up our file, and hopefully it looks. There's one thing to remember about this is that I think we've written the data, but I bet you if we do an ls-l and look at our data file, who can see the size of our data.csv? How big is that file? Zero, Zero bytes. That's a little scary. When you write stuff, it does what's called buffering, and it doesn't put it out to disk until you say, I need to flush this to the disk and get it out there. And one easy way to do that is to close the file that you're writing. Once it's closed, it's going to finish writing up whatever's left over to write. So we can say out.close. And now if we do ls-l data.csv, I'm hoping that we have 13. Let's go ahead and open that file. So if we do control x, control f, and I did a control x2 to split first. Oh, yep, 13 bytes. Very small file, but it's a good start. There's data we can do, with, do stuff with. There's lots of ways to have created this, and in the past we've just done a wget or a curl to go grab it. But now that you're in Python, it's more fun to be creating data on your own. Yep. Then you need to type in the path to where it is, so it's in class 11. And then press tab. And tab again. And now you should see a data.csv. Yeah, so just type in D and then tab. So it's in class 11. So tilde slash CL, press tab. Now to press tab again. Again. Now you see that there's an 11, so type 11, tab. So you've opened the directory. Um, press G in there. The letter, just the letter G, because you're in directory edit mode. Show me the terminal where you wrote the file. Mm -hmm. Bring that front. Do a PWD, print working directory. See how you wrote it in your home directory? So you didn't put it in class slash 11. So you have to go back to Emacs. This is OK. You just have to work out of a different directory. And do control X, control F. 
delete till it's just tilde slash. Now press tab. Again, press D and then tab. See, now you have a data.csv, so then an A and then tab. Press A and then tab. There you go. Press enter and you'll see the Yay, awesome. Go to your terminal real quick and type PWD in there. The other thing is you did out.close without the parentheses. Hit the up arrow to that till you see the same line again. One more. And put left parenthesis, right parenthesis. So it runs the, the little function. So take a look up on the screen. At the end, yeah. So by putting a parenthesis means go run this. This close thing that, that files have. And I'm going to completely avoid any discussion of object-oriented programming. If you hear that, you can close your ears and ignore it. You'll be doing object-oriented programming, but we don't care that we're doing that. It doesn't really matter. It's a lot of vocabulary that you'll hear a little bit. And we could spend six months talking about it, and then I'd be really, really boring. I don't know. That wouldn't be any fun. So we're going to do object-type stuff. And that's what this is, the little dot and then some close and parentheses. We're running some function that's attached to some data or a file or something. So do an ls-l. And do you have a data? .csv. Yep, there it is. OK. So see when you hit tab there, it gave you two items, data.csv and download. Type an A. See how the A is bold right there? It's giving you an A or O. So press A. Where? Down here. Yep. Yeah, just type A. Oh, sorry. You had the D. That was good. So tilde slash, D, and then an A. And then now press an A. Now tab. There you go. Now press Enter. Changed on disk. Uh, type yes. So if you see a changed on disk, that means that something else has changed that file and it already knew about that. Yeah. So you'd managed to open up your data.csv somehow before without realizing it. Okay. The data file got changed and then you okay. had to reload it. Great. Cool. Let's go see if we can read this data really quick in the last two minutes that we have here. About using IPython in Emacs, is that deal? Or? You can. It's not, you might get tripped up on a couple little things. So I was trying to avoid those little hiccups today if we could. So let's go ahead and do a quick example of reading it. So to do that, I'm going to have a variable called data file equals open. And before, right here, I had a comma and then a single quote w saying write. The default is read, which is a lot safer than writing because you can't step on any data. If you press enter here and you say type data file, it's a file. That's great. If we say data file, read lines, this is uh, read everything all at once, pull it in, and just hit enter. We've now pulled in a whole bunch of data, and it kind of went nowhere. We didn't save it. So we can reopen the file. So I'm going to scroll back up to my open command. If I run this again, it's going to reopen the file and start me back at the beginning of the file. And we can say data file dot read line. And notice that before we had read lines plural, which grabbed all of them. Here we're going to read one line at a time. There's no S in there. So just hit read line. And you get back that first line of your file. And if we do it again, we get the second line, the third line, and wait, what? Read lines, plural. So, this one. so data file, period. Read lines. Lines. Mm -hmm. And then print. That's just a. Without the parentheses, it's not going to actually run. So left parenthesis, right parenthesis. You're going to call that, and you've now read the whole file. Yep. So the command was read lines, plural. So up arrow. Now did you hit hit tab. OK, so you notice how it said data file not defined? So I, th I think you're a few even back before that. Do you, see, do you see line 201 up there on the screen? So you need to do what, what I have is line 201 on the screen. So data file equals open data.csv. Data file equals. Do you see line 201 up there? If you don't open the file and get started with that, then single quote data.csv, single quote, 
press enter. Now you can do data file dot breed lines. So we are out of time for today. Now you've at least seen some of the basics of variables and reading lines and files. Please do watch the Python video one. It goes through very similar stuff, but I'll set it slightly differently. And it'll be paced at your own pace because you can hit pause where in here it's kind of hard to make me pause. See how that goes. I'm not going to give you any homework till next time, and we'll keep it pretty simple. This is the basics of programming, and we're, we're doing what, in a typical computer science class with C programming, reading a file comes at, I don't know, a month or two into doing C. And here, you've been doing Python for an hour and 40 minutes. So you're doing what a computer scientist would do after two months of study in an hour and a half. So don't feel like if it's getting a little over your head, you're going really fast compared to the traditional way to teach this stuff. But I'm hoping by the end of next week that you guys will be able to read in text-based data pretty comfortably.